Hello and welcome to the special PIR live event webinar brought to you by Partners in Research Canada. Thanks for helping us celebrate Science Literacy Week 2018. Thanks also to the National Science and Engineering Research Council and the Center for Planetary Science and Exploration at Western University. My name is Stacy Joyce and I will be your host. If you're joining us live, remember that you can ask questions anytime by clicking chat near the bottom of your screen. Make sure to select everyone in the to field and then type it in. I will relay these questions to our guest a little bit later on. Please do make sure that when you ask your question, just add a little tag on there for where the question is coming from, whether that's a student first name or what city you're joining from or the teacher's name, any of the above. And we would love to give you a shout out so that you know that we're asking your question. Today's webinar is extra special because we have close to 900 students joining us live from Newfoundland through British Columbia, including two special groups joining us by video. Let's have a peek at our on-camera locations. First, we have the Saskatchewan Science Center team on site at Ruth M. Buck School with Ms. Landgraf's class in Regina, Saskatchewan. Can you say hello and give us a wave? <laughs> Oh, we even got a bonus floss in there. All right, well, my six-year-old will be happy. And let's check in with the Johnson Geo Center in St. John's. I think we have a bit of a different crowd here, but uh, can everybody give us a wave and a hello? <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, well, we also have a few other guests with us online. We have... Um, where am I here? We have Dr. Parshadi Patel. She is the Education and Outreach Program Coordinator at CPSX at Western University. She's joining us from London, Ontario. Oh, I'm trying to unmute you here and that's not going well. Let's try that again. Oh, you have your, your audio muted. There we go. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Parshadi. Okay, and last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Gordon Nizinski, who is known to many as simply Oz. He is an associate professor and NSERC slash MDA slash CSA Industrial Research Chair in Planetary Geology. He is also the director for the Center for Planetary Science and Exploration, or CPSX for short, at Western University. Thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome. Hello, everyone. So from this point on, I'd like to turn it over to Oz. If you want to go ahead and share your screen, we would love to hear your introduction to the world of planetary geology and impact craters. Absolutely. So hopefully everyone can see my screen now. <clears throat> and uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in Canada. And it's my pleasure to uh, be here virtually anyway to talk about making craters. So let's just jump straight into it. Um, so what are impact craters and what is impact cratering? Well, um, we now know from the study of 40 or 50 years of geology that uh, the moon and other objects in the solar system are continually hit by other objects out there. And we'll get to that in a second. But really the best place to look at craters and to understand uh, craters is the moon, our closest neighbor. And even on a clear night, you'll have gazed up at the moon, I'm sure, and seen these dark black splotches on the moon. So those are impact basins where asteroids many hundreds of kilometers across struck hundreds if not billions of years ago. And on the bottom left, um, you actually see um, a close-up of the moon, and you can see that there are literally hundreds and hundreds of impact craters. Um, some are small, they're quite dark in this image, and others are bigger, they have flat floors and actually have mountains in the center of them. And we can get as to why uh, that occurs a little later on. So what forms craters? Well, we've hinted at this already. Um, I'm sure you've all seen images of the solar system or schematics of the solar system. Uh, I really like this one from NASA because it shows, of course, the eight planets, um, but it also shows that and demonstrates that you know space is not empty. And excuse me, I'm gonna take my phone off the hook. 
Um, and so uh, here we have a comment coming in from the top right to the bottom left. And the important thing also, you see these scattered rocks between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And that, that's the asteroid belt. And of course, that is all material left over from the formation of the solar system uh, many billions of years ago. And excuse me. Okay. And so the most common thing to actually hit um, the Earth and the Moon, and in fact, all other objects in the solar system are asteroids. And so again, there's a picture from a couple of space missions on the left-hand side of the screen now. And these are asteroids, bits of rock left over from the, the formation of our solar system about four and a half billion years ago. So your test for today is to actually count all of these impact craters on the Moon. Um, we're not actually going to do that. It would be an incredibly kind of cruel and time-consuming job. Um, but you can see on this image that the Moon is literally pockmarked by impact craters. And some folks actually have counted this with the aid of computers and, uh, and software. And we now know that there's something like 30,000 impact craters on the Moon. Well, we don't live on the Moon. We, of course, live on Earth. And so, you know, this is a, a general perspective of Earth that we have. And, uh, you know, uh, I'll challenge you to find an impact crater on this screen. I would be hard pushed. I kind of know where they should be. But it's actually really difficult to see impact craters on Earth and from space. And again, if you have questions about this and why this is later on, we can definitely get to that. Um, but this is, you know, a, a digital elevation model of the Earth. So it's the Earth unwrapped. And all these little red dots are actually impact craters that have been confirmed. And so we now know of about 188 craters on Earth. And you'll recognize, if you know your geography of our planet, that Canada actually has a lot of these red dots. And in fact, Canada has more craters you know, um, in, than any other country on Earth. We're up to about 30 now. And to take a look at some of these, um, there's some very famous ones, the one in the top right. The Horton Crater is up in Nunavut on Devon Island, and that's the one that I've spent almost 20 years of my career studying. In the top left is Pingualit in uh, northern Quebec. Um, the bottom left and bottom right are another couple of craters in, in Quebec. So Quebec actually has the most craters uh, in Canada, and they range from a few kilometers across to the Mag Manicouagan Crater that you can actually see from the space shuttle. And so that uh, object in the bottom left of that image is actually the tail fin of the space shuttle. So that is a crater that you can see from space. So today you're going to make craters. So let's actually talk about how they form in reality. And uh, then we'll get to you making impact craters in uh, your classrooms or in the science museum uh, a little later on. So when an impact occurs, what is happening is that the asteroid or comet is coming in at many kilometers a second. So actually the formation of a crater is unlike any other geological process on Earth. The energies released are more, 10 orders of magnitude more than even nuclear weapons or the most explosive volcanic eruptions. And when an impact occurs, what happens is that a shock wave radiates out from the point of impact. And so what that means is that a, um, uh, a crater, a transient crater, is bigger than the actual projectile itself. And most often, the impactor, so that's the asteroid or comet, is completely destroyed. So if you're wondering if you can walk around craters and find pieces of what came in, the answer is typically no. And the kind of final product is uh, something that looks like this. So this is like taking a slice through this crater. And one of the things that you're going to be looking at a lot today is what we call impact ejector. So this is the material that started off in the crater and is literally thrown outwards by the energy of the impact. And while you're not modeling a giant asteroid coming in and striking the Earth today, you will all form, hopefully, uh, impact ejector deposits around your very tiny craters uh, in your classroom. Uh, so those pictures I showed earlier on of craters on Earth are a little misleading because that's not what impact craters actually look like when they're fresh. On Earth, we have a lot of erosion going on, and so the craters are continually modified. And so this image on the screen here is the Tycho crater on the moon. It may not look like much, but that white hole in the center there is almost 100 kilometers across. And you see these beautiful linear rays uh, uh, moving out from the point of impact, and we call those ejector rays. And so watch out uh, for those when you form your craters a little later on. 
And so, you know, I could talk for hours about impact creators, um, but we only have an hour for you to actually model some impact creators too. And so what I wanted to do is uh, actually I'm excited to announce this because this is something we've been working on for a number of years now. And you are the first people anywhere in the world who are getting a glimpse of our new website, impactearth.uwo.ca. And on here, there's an interactive map where you can explore creators. And if you're an educator or a teacher in the science museum, if you go under activities and resources, you'll see information about uh, what we're doing today. But you can also request rock kits, so actually rocks from impact creators, and we have some lesson plans as well. And so um, without further ado, uh, we're now going to hand over to Pashari, who's going to give a bit of a demonstration about what you're going to do today, and then we'll hand over to you all. And so I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and hand back to Stacy. Wonderful. Thank you. So we are going to, um, we're going to go ahead and do a, a demonstration there with Parshadi, and then we're going to come back to you, uh, Dr. Zinsky, for that slide that you have that shows us that sort of cross section of a crater, because we definitely have some students who are working on a worksheet that will need to have a look at that to fill out their worksheet. So I am going to turn it over to uh, Parshadi from CPSX now. Hello everyone. So today you guys are going to be making your own impact creators. So every one of you will have either in groups or individually um, a can in which you have flour and a little bit of cocoa powder dusted on it. And what you will be doing is you guys will be using different impact tours. So I have a couple of different objects right here for, with me that I'm going to be using as impact tours. So it can range from golf size balls to um, hockey ball or um, anything in between. And uh, basically, I'm going to be using a hockey, uh, golf ball to demonstrate what you guys will be doing. So you will be needing, if you guys are going to be measuring um, changing height, uh, how high this ball is going from, uh, you'll be needing a meter stick. So here I have my meter stick. Uh, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be measuring my height. So there are a few different things you can, uh, you can change, and there are a few different things you can measure. So one of the things that you can change is certainly how high the ball is coming from, but also something you can change is how, you know, um, how heavy this ball is or from what angle it's coming in um, and or what size it is. So today I'm going to demonstrate um, just one of the many variables that you can change. So that's going to be height. So for example, let me start with the height of 50 centimeters, which is right here. Um, this is going to be at the base of my flower. Uh, 50 centimeters, I would use the object uh, that I would like as an impact tour. Just something to remember though, is when you're changing the height, you should not be changing any other variables. So I'm not going to change my uh, impact tour at every stage that I'm going to change my height. And it has to be the same object that you're uh, dropping from different heights. So uh, let's do a drop and then we're going to look at what an impact crater looks like in my hand. All right. All right, so now I'm going to bring out my impact tour, and we're going to bring the laptop closer in so you guys can see how the impact crater looks like. So you can see, you can see the white ejector rays that uh, Dr. Oz was showing right there. Uh, we also have a very, very deep impact crater right here. So what we're going to do next is we need to measure a few different things. Um, you could either measure how deep this crater is, so I would use um, a ruler and basically poke this in right here to measure how deep the crater is. You can measure the radius or diameter uh, by just placing your ruler just like that. You can also measure um, the length of the ejector rays. So I could measure the length of the ejector rays just by placing right this at the um, edge of the crater towards the longest ejector rays that I can see. So those are a few different ways you can uh, design your experiment. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask you guys to come up with these uh, variables and design your own experiment. And then you guys will be able to make your own impact craters and um, your own experiment. Thank you so much. Now everybody's been able to see what it is that we are doing today. Uh, right from Dr. Patel, thank you so much. I think this is probably the millionth time she has dropped some type of impactor into sunflower and cocoa. But uh, now the next thing we have to do is, um, we're gonna do sort of two things at once here. So I am going to invite uh, Dr. Zinsky to share his screen again. If you would go ahead and share with us that slide of the cross section of an impact crater. 
Okay, so. And what we're going to do is, we well, now. thank you, that's perfect. So I am going to go ahead and mute you again so you don't have to worry about making noise. And we are going to leave this on the screen so that you can copy this out uh, as, you, as you may need to if you're on a, a worksheet there. And, uh, and at the same time, I'm going to invite you to type out in the chat some independent variables and dependent variables. And we are going to brainstorm within your classroom and, uh, and together from coast to coast. So right now I have uh, the Google Sheet open, so I will share that with you once we've filled it, or you're welcome to click on the link that I shared in the chat at the very beginning and put that up on your own screen as well. But uh, if you can type into the chat and let me know where you're joining from and perhaps one thing that you can change, an independent variable, and or one thing that you could measure when you're doing this experiment, that would be a dependent variable. So you let me know which one, something you can change or something you can measure and go ahead and type that into the chat. Or if you're logged in on the Google document, you can type it directly into the Google document. And while we're doing that, we also have, of course, the the crater uh, model showing on the screen here so that you can copy that out to know the lingo of planetary geology as you go through the activity. So I am going to start us off here. I know that uh, Dr. Parshiti Patel showed us that uh, she was planning on varying her drop height so that was the, the meter stick that she used to figure out how high she was dropping the ball from and, uh, and to perhaps see what effect that has. So we've got drop height as one independent variable because she was setting that herself. She was changing that on purpose. So that's an independent variable. And I can see here that we have uh, we have the tech dudes suggesting that the dependent variable or what you could measure might be how deep the crater goes. So I'll say crater depth. We have a few more coming in here. We also have oh, dropping from a different angle as an independent one from Ms. Cowell's class. So drop angle, tricky to change, but definitely something you could. And everybody is jumping in now, that's wonderful. You could change the diameter of the ball and measure the diameter of the impact crater. So changing the diameter of the ball, that would be something that you are changing on purpose. So that's your independent variable. Uh, so I'm going to put ball, or impactor size and we said you could measure the diameter of the crater so how big it is from side to side wonderful let's see what else we have here we have you could measure the ejector rays excellent that is also something that dr patel showed us That came from Ms. Baudoin's class, or Baudoin. And Ms. Larmer's class also came up with the angle of the impact, great. Oh, we have one here that is the speed. Uh, so instead of dropping, if you were to accelerate the impactor toward the surface. That might be difficult to do, but if you find out a way, we'd love for you to share. You could change the mass of the object. Good job. The mass of the impactor. And let's see what else we have here. Lots to scroll through, that's great.
Oh, I like this one. Ms. Cowell's class is thinking outside the box here. They're, they're wanting to change the experimental setup and maybe change the ingredient you're dropping the ball into. So what if the surface isn't made of flour? Maybe it's sugar or chocolate chips or ice or slime. I love who came up with slime. So you could change the uh, surface materials. Is there anything else you can think of that you might want to measure? Oh, that's an interesting one. Mr. Scott's class says you could find out the terminal velocity by using a Sphero. They have a program to measure speed. So you could drop a Sphero in. Hopefully that wouldn't ruin your Sphero, dropping it into some flour. Hopefully it's nice and sealed up. Oh, the shape. Ms. Lillycrop's class is suggesting we could change the shape of the impactor. Uh, you could change the depth of the surface. See if that has any effect. All right, we've got lots of things here. I hope you have lots as well. I am going to check in with Dr. Parshadi Patel because I think she's an expert on this. What are we missing, Dr. Patel, for things you could measure? We're a little low on things you could measure. We've got crater depth, crater diameter or size, and eject array length. Are we missing? I I think we could also add, this is uh, very hard to measure in the experiment that we are doing, but something that is the crater rim that could also be measured. Uh, luckily in our demo, um, we were able to create a little bit of crater rim. Um, however, it's, very, uh, it's not very uh, consistent uh, with uh, the experiment that we're currently doing. But that's one of the other things you could measure as well, is the crater rim. And so where would the crater rim, where would you measure that against? Is it so the surface of the cocoa? So that would basically be, so if you imagine um, a, a level of the, the flower, okay, anything that's above the level, so you have a crater that goes a little bit above and then down into the uh, ejector rays. So that level that is just a little bit above the level of the flower is what we would call the rim height. Okay, wonderful. All right, so I think uh, at this point, what I would like to do is set all of our students to going ahead and deciding from our list that we have together uh, or possibly from their own list. Maybe you've got a list on the board in your class or, um, or you just already know what you want to investigate. I'm going to ask that you begin your activity now and, uh, and decide what you're going to change in your group and what you're going to measure and, uh, and we'll see what you come up with for how your independent variables uh, change your dependent variables, how they are linked. So we're going to go ahead and, and get you to start on that. And, um, and then in the meantime, uh, I will share that list on screen so you can refer to that. And, uh, and we might pop on with a few questions and we're certainly going to check in with our on-screen locations and see how things are going there. They can show us what's happening there. So uh, for now, Dr. Zinski, if you could stop the sharing of your screen, I will then share the list that we came up with together. For anyone who's not signed into the, to the Google Sheet, there it is for you. And uh, if you do have something to add, feel free. You can click on, I'll, I'll put the link here again in the chat. And, uh, and that way you can click on there and add it if we've missed something that maybe you are investigating in your room. Um, and, uh, and then we'll check in and see how that's going. I also invite you to share any photos. Maybe you have a phenomenal crater or you have some amazing ejector rays that you wanted to showcase. Or maybe you're doing something really different than what most people are doing with a different material in your pan. Um, we would love for you to share some photos and you can do that using uh, Twitter is probably the best one with the hashtag SciLit. So I'll put that hashtag in the chat as well so that we can all share the fun things that we are doing together today.
So for the next little while, what you will hear from us on the webinar are things that you do not need to be tuned into. Please go ahead, investigate, uh, work on some experiments. We just don't want to leave you hanging. So, uh, so we're going to maybe chat about a few things. Um, but don't worry if you miss something. We really want you to be diving in with your own experiment there. So we do have about 20 minutes, I think, for that experiment. Uh, and then at that point, we'll start uh, answering more questions. And at any time, please do um, come onto the chat and, uh, and type in a question. Maybe you're doing your activity and that has sparked a question for you that you would like us to ask Dr. Zinsky or maybe Dr. Patel. And, uh, and maybe they would have an answer that could help you with your activity or just help you solve a, a question that you're kind of wondering about. So for now, I think what I would like to do is um, I'd like to ask Dr. Azinski, um, maybe what is one of the most interesting places that you have traveled for your research? Yeah, so, you know, as a geologist and one who studies craters, I do have to go all over the world. Uh, but I think still my, one of my favorite places and where I was up again this summer uh, is the Canadian Arctic. Um, you know, well up above Baffin Island, there's uh, the Horton Impact Crater there. Lies in a polar desert environment, so there's no uh, plants around or anything, and it's just a, a beautiful, barren uh, place to do geology and uh, to spend some time. Oh, I think you have muted, Stacy. See, I told you I would forget at least one time. Um, what is something really interesting or unexpected about traveling to the Canadian Arctic for research? Uh, you know, I think maybe what is unexpected when I first went up and to most people is how long it takes to get there. Um, you know, a, a lot of what I do is space exploration too. And, you know, there's a lot of discussion about returning to the moon uh, and even as a tourist now. And you know, the moon's three days away and that's about what it takes for me to get from London to my field site up in the Canadian Arctic. So. Yeah, you know, logistics are very difficult. Uh, there's a lot of plane journeys, you know, five, six or seven flights to actually get to where we're, to where we're going. Right. And where do you stay when you're in the Arctic? Do you camp in tents? Are there lodgings for you there? Most of the places I go to, yeah, we camp in a tent. Uh, we literally get dropped off in the middle of nowhere and uh, pitch up tent and uh, a base camp and, you know, away we go. I think there's this view of a, a scientist and researcher being someone in a white lab coat in a building somewhere, but that's really not what you're describing. No, absolutely. And I mean, that's a big part of why I actually got into geology and you know, earth science and geography in the first place, the first place is to, so I could get, out, get outside and explore uh, yeah, uh, all over the earth. And uh, what types of other experts do you find yourself collaborating with in the course of your research? <clears throat> That's a great question. And, you know, one thing about impact craters is that it's, uh, it's a very energetic process and it, it, it's a very interdisciplinary study. And so, you know, I collaborate with physicists uh, who do computer modeling of craters. I mean, astronomers who look at craters on other planetary objects. Um, one of the things we can talk about a little later, you know, is the, the biological effects of impacts. And so, you know, a lot of what I do is both the destructive and the positive um, biological effects of impacts. And so I do find myself collaborating with, you know, biologists, physicists, astronomers, chemists who are studying the chemistry of what happens during an impact too. Wonderful. So I see that uh, we have students getting themselves all settled in Regina here. Uh, I'd like to check in with our... Um, our Johnson Geo Center in St. John's and see if anyone has a has a crater there yet. Uh, I'm not sure if they've had a chance. I will unmute you. You can let me know. How's it going there in St. John? Oh, it's going great. We've got plenty of different activity, different uh, uh, impacts have been done. I'll just grab one of the pans. So in this one, we had different mass, but also different shaped objects. You see, we used a cubic object here, and this one was round. It's starting to fall apart because it got you on an angle there. 
But mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people here have had a lot of fun with changing different shapes because I decided to use some irregularly shaped uh, objects. And how did you find that the, the craters changed? What changed when you used a different shaped object? Well, you tend to not get the ejecta in the same kind of uh, the spiral shape as you saw in the big circular one there. So also it was really close to the edge of the pan there, so it was kind of hard to see some of that impact as well. Uh, but it was interesting because, it, again, it doesn't really look as exactly the same because you got these square sides that aren't going to normally be in a meteorite. That makes sense. Thank you very much for sharing. I know that we are planning on, well, hello there. Go ahead and hello and a wave if you'd like. You're saying thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome. I'm glad you had fun. Um, also, I know we're coming back to you in a little bit because you have sort of a special setup that you use, I'm aware of, for, um, for measuring angle if you're doing a different angle of impact. Yeah, so what we're going to do is I'm going to shoot a paintball gun into the, the bin I have over here to the side. So if you want, we can do that whenever you like. Uh, just let me know. And uh, I'll just have to get one of the people here to move the camera so you can see what we're doing. Okay, so we will get ready to do that in a little bit. I'm going to check in with our other classroom first and right. see if we have some questions. We'll, I think we'll do that probably in about five or five or eight minutes or something like that. So we'll talk okay. to you again soon. Awesome. All right, let's check in with Ms. Landgraf's class in Regina. I'm going to unmute you now. You guys look like you are hard at work. How are things going? Everybody's super busy. I see lots of meter sticks in the air, everyone measuring their drop height. Okay, so I have a question now coming from Brookville. If a second impactor lands on top of a first impactor, would the crater formed be larger and would the ejector rays be bigger? And I'm going to pass that one to you, Oz. What do you think? Well, that's a, a great question. Um, typically, uh, you know, and a good place to look is the moon, actually, where we do find lots of craters, craters overlapping one another. Um, it shouldn't really affect how far, I think there was two things you asked, how far the rays go. That should remain the same. And actually, if anything, if those rays go into the, the original crater that was formed, they actually might not go as far because they're blocked by that initial crater. And uh, I'm trying to think, what was the, the second question you were asking? Um, uh, would the crater be larger? So that is definitely possible. Um, yeah, as what will happen is that the, you know, we haven't really talked about this, but obviously huge amount of energy really fractures the, the rocks and the crust of any particular object and that makes it weaker and so when that second object comes in it could actually probably excavate more for the same amount of energy so that's a great question and uh, we do think that actually will happen wonderful i'm going to pause here from questions because we have a comment coming in from cameron at prms just wanting to say that they think science is really awesome and all science is good science. Also, good job to everyone involved uh, for this really awesome event and, and a big thank you. So I wanted to pass that on because I know a lot of this event is, uh, you know, the time that uh, Dr. Zinsky and Dr. Patel have taken to let us know a bit more about uh, planetary geology. So just passing along a thank you from one of our students. Thank you, totally welcome. Uh, let's see. So I'm trying not to ask too many of these questions that basically ask, if we change this, what would it do to the crater? And so I want to give some of our classrooms a chance that they might, um, they might be investigating that. So I don't want to give them the answer yet. I want them to do their, their experiment and see. But uh, maybe we'll take this one. I know it's difficult for many classrooms to measure eject arrays uh, very accurately. So perhaps we'll ask um, the question from Ms. Larmer's class, if the impactor was, um, was a lot larger, would it make the eject arrays twice 
its size? Is there some relationship there? Uh, we, we actually don't know. You know, it's a good question. And uh, one of the things that keeps me interested in craters is that they haven't really been studied in much detail. Um, you know, geology has been around for hundreds of years, but it's only the last couple of decades where we really begun to study craters in detail. And uh, we're not really sure if there's a relationship, as you say, between the size of the crater or impact and crater rays. And even exactly how they form is still a little bit uh, unclear. But it's definitely something, if you look at craters on other planets, like that one on the moon I showed, they, some, interestingly, some craters form big rays and some don't. And so uh, still trying to figure that out. That's really interesting to know uh, that we are still trying to figure out those answers. It seems like it might be simple, but uh, we can't really create these things on a planetary scale just to test it out. Exactly. Nor would we want to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to check in now with uh, the students in Miss Landgrass again. I see some more goings on there. Uh, hello to Miss Landgrass class. You are on screen. Do you have any craters that you can share with us or any findings so far? How are things going there? I have a feeling that everyone is so involved and it's loud enough in the classroom that they might not be able to hear us right now. <laughs> All right, well, back to questions then. We'll leave them to it. Uh, let's go to a question from Ethan at PRMS. Wondering if the material of the ground affects the crater size, and I will unmute you there. Go ahead, Dr. Zinsky. Yeah, and you know, that, that, yes, <laughs> that's the answer. Um, and uh, you know, that's something you can maybe experiment too, is are uh, you using flour and cocoa powder now, but if you use something that was, let's say, uh, that was stronger, so, well, rock would be one thing, but something that was maybe a bit more stuck and glued together, you would find that for the same, you know, same height, same projectile, same everything else, the crater would actually be smaller. And so, yeah, the energy that goes into excavating the crater does change quite dramatically depending on what type of rock you hit, and whether it's, you know, rock versus sand versus flour. So that's another great question. So we're creating in this experiment a really nice uniform surface, um, and, uh, and so the crater, if you're using a symmetrical impactor, like a ball, seems to be very symmetric. Are there examples where maybe the, the ground surface is not so uniform and that's affected the, um, the attributes of the crater? Yeah, uh, again, a great question from you, Stacey. Um, and again, the moon is a good example of this because there are, so many craters, you keep getting, you know, craters over printing, other craters over the, the billions of years um, of geological history there. And so um, they tend to start off circular, but by the end of the crater forming process, which is only a few seconds, then they become quite heavily modified. And, uh, you know, there's some, there's a great example in, uh, on Mars where the crater formed on the, the edge of Valles Marineris, you know, like the Grand Canyon of Mars. And essentially, half the crater just fell into the canyon, and so you only have half left. And so, yeah, the, the topography and whether you're into a mountain versus a flat slope uh, definitely will change the, the shape of the final crater. Interesting. Is there anything else that's top of mind for you that has a, a huge impact on what the initial crater uh, would, would look like or how big it would be or what shape? Um, any other changes in, in real planetary geology that's not based on flour and cocoa? <laughs> no, I mean, you're, we're, we're, the biggest influence is actually the angle of impact. And so we talked about that and we might be having a, a demonstration from St. John's a little later on, it seems. But, uh, you know, slope is one thing and how rough the surface is, but the, the biggest thing is angle of impact. I uh, maybe won't give the game away in case we, uh, we look at it a little bit. <laughs> okay, so we'll come back to that one. I'm just going to give a heads up to those at the Johnson Geo Center. I'm going to come back to you in, uh, in a quick minute here, and, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to, to do the paint gun 
um, or the paintball gun demo with a, an angle there. But before we do that, while I let you get set, um, we have a question from Brookville wondering what is the largest crater um, that maybe the largest one on earth and then the largest one we know about sure. anywhere. Yep. So the lot, there's three big ones on earth. Um, the biggest one we estimated about 300 kilometers across and that is in South Africa. Um, but actually the second biggest one on, on our planet is uh, Sudbury. So I don't know. I don't think we have any people dialing in from Sudbury today in Ontario. Um, but the, the, Greater Sudbury is actually within what was once about a 250 kilometer diameter impact crater. So, you know, I'm here in London, Ontario right now. And so that would be a, a big hole in the ground between, you know, either here or Windsor and, uh, you know, from here to Toronto. Um, in a solar system, you know, the, there's a bit of a competition about which one's the biggest because they actually get really hard to measure when they're that big. But you know, two or three thousand kilometers across, there's some examples on both the Moon and Mars uh, that you know it, it's a bit mind-boggling that you would have a crater, you know, two three thousand kilometers across. But those are kind of the record holders. I'm trying to think that must be larger than a few countries on Earth. Yeah, I mean, maybe not quite Canada, but you know, all of Western Europe, you could put in one of those craters for sure. Um, all right, so let's check in now and, and see if we can get any clues about the, uh, the angle of impact. We'll check in with the um, Johnson Geo Center in St. John's. How's it going there in St. John's? Hello, we're good. We're having a, having a deep conversation with some of our visitors here. This um, is what so happens with science. Are yeah, we all set for, uh, for that demonstration? Yes, I'm going to just ask uh, one so what I'm going to do here is I'm just getting my paintball gun ready. I think classrooms across the country are jealous right now. <laughs> yeah, uh, grade nines have come very easy jealous. So first of all, this is now a loaded weapon, so I'm going to point it up the floor. <laughs> I'm going to ask uh, one of you if you could just take the camera and kind of point it at that area over there. You're not going to be able to get too close. Maybe I'll bring it over with me. If you tell me to... if I've got near that area, because I so can't down tell. Down a little bit. Down. There we go. There? All right. So what we're going to do is I have the same flour and cocoa that you guys have. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it a little bit closer to the wall. We have a tarp there, so I'm, I'm expecting a bit of a mess here. All right, yeah, that's good there with your camera. So, the camera can see everything? Yeah, everything is fine. So, what we're going to do is save yeah, these off. Everybody else backs off. <laughs> so, I'm going to fire this at about roughly 45 degree angle, and, and it is a paintball gun, and we're going to well, see what happens. Before you do it, is it still on? The, you've got the camera on? Yeah, camera is camera's good. All right, so firing in three, two, one. <laughs> So hopefully you can see with the camera a little bit. I'll just grab my cord here because I got it looped around, of course, the wrong opposite way. Let's see. So you can see what we have here is a much larger impact. And it's spread out. It's not perfectly circular because, again, of the angle that we've come in. And the ejecta is actually blown completely onto the tarp. It's hard for you to see it. I can kind of see a bit of ejecta line just because the tarp has been used for five years now. We have a lot of paintball residue in it. And one of the things I often use with grade nines is talk about how you can't see that paintball anymore. Because when an object hits and makes a crater like this, of course, it's obliterated. And uh, we often talk about Sudbury, Ontario, and their mining explorations that go on there because of this. So do you ever all enjoy that? I, well, I don't know about everybody else, but I enjoy it. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. And I just, I'm in love with the fact that we have lifelong learners in St. John's today <laughs> learning about planetary geology. Oh, yes, we got some, we got some great lifelong learners here. Do Maybe. you have any questions at the Johnson Geo Center that you'd like to ask our guest expert today? Well, we've got our expert right here. <laughs> That's no. fair enough. 
Yeah. One thing I will mention, I did show to all of them, I think I have here, we have a meteorite as well. So just kind of as an example of uh, when they do survive that we do like to pass out because not everybody gets a chance to touch an actual meteorite. So we have one that we, uh, we pass around to them as well during the webinar. Well, thank you so much for sharing. And uh, I'm going to see if we can check in with Regina now, if we can check in with Ms. Landgraf's class. I wonder if they can hear us now. Can you hear us in Regina? Yeah. All right. You were so busy dropping your impactors and measuring everything carefully. We tried to check with you twice and you were so busy you didn't even hear us. <laughs> Does anyone have a really great crater they'd like to share or anything at all that you'd like to show us? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, the floss, yes. Maybe something to do with planetary geology. All right, it looks like we've got a, a tray coming up here. Let's go and share. And his balls make them flat. You want to hold that there? No, Joey's sharing. She doesn't need to find something here, Joey. All right, if we get an angle down. Wow. So what were we measuring here? What did you change? So what did you change during your experiment? The other experiment we put each one separate. Okay. So we tried dropping a couple at once. And then did you drop them or did we try throwing them too? I threw the one that was there. You threw the one that was there. So even though this one's a lot lighter, since we threw it, it still made a pretty, pretty good sized crater compared to the heavier one. And there's cracks in it too. Yeah. Perfect. That's excellent. Thank you for sharing. So what, what things did we change in the room? What did students decide to make their independent variables as? So what did we change? Yeah, Jackson. I changed the speed of the ball. So the speed of the ball, what else? The height. The height. The weight. The weight. So what we used? The force. The force. The speed, yeah. Anything else? Is there anything else we changed? Yeah. The height. Do we always drop them straight down or do we drop them from an angle sometimes? Angle. Yeah, so the angle that the crater hit, so we a little bit of We had some foreign objects. We did have some foreign objects. <laughs> we had a pencil. <laughs> well, it sounds like you had fun, but I'm not sure. Did you have fun? Yeah! <laughs> Wonderful. And did you come to any conclusions when you looked at what you changed and what effect that had? Did you notice if changing something made the crater bigger or smaller or made it a different shape? Did you, did you figure out any relationship between changing one thing and the effect it would have? No, but we noticed there were a lot of certain things in the thing that made big holes, and there were a lot of things that made little holes. And the little made like lines out of it. The big holes made like tiny lines. That sounded like a great explanation, but I'm so sorry to say that I didn't really hear it. Would you like to holler it out or maybe oh, come closer? Yeah. <laughs> and the rest of you need to stop playing right now and listen to your classmates, okay? So I know the littlest thing things made bigger holes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, this question is how many craters are there? How many craters are there on Earth? All right, so I am going to unmute our guest there because I admit I do not know the answer to that question. How about you, Dr. Zinthi? Yeah, so we, we know of about 180, 190 impact craters on Earth today. Um, but, uh, you know, based on how many there are on the moon, there should be thousands and thousands of impact craters on Earth. Um, but they're either under the ocean or have been destroyed by volcanism and eroded over time. But currently, about 190 impact craters on Earth. Thank you. So why is it that we can see the impact craters so clearly on the moon compared to Earth? Why are they so much easier to see there? Uh, so the, they're easier to see on the moon because they're better preserved. And again, it goes back to, we, can, we actually use craters to give us some understanding about how active a planet is. Um, and so for example, there's the moon of Jupiter, Io, and we've not seen a single impact crater on that planet. And uh, essentially, the laws of probability are that every object in the solar system, you know, should be hit uh, at approximately the same rate. And so it turns out Io is actually the most volcanically active object in the solar system. So there's volcanism continually happening. And so it's not that impacts are not occurring. They are occurring, but they're getting continually erased. Whereas on the moon, the moon essentially stopped being active about three or four billion years ago. And so, you know, it's a, there's a bit of rock out there and things keep hitting the poor old moon and um, the craters just keep building up and building up. I see. And we had a question um, that's been partially answered so far about an impactor and when it hits the ground, is it possible for pieces of it to be left in the crater? So we've already answered, we, we saw a piece of a meteorite at the Johnson Geo Center. But what I'd like to have you comment on is maybe how likely that is or how often we might find something because you said sometimes there's nothing left. Yeah, and so I would say most of the time there's nothing left. Um, the only craters in the world where we found bits of the meteorite left are fairly small. Um, the biggest is a meteor crater in Arizona, actually. If you're ever down there on holiday or vacation, it's quite near the Grand Canyon, and it's just over a kilometer across, and there were, before people picked them all up, lots of bit of the meteorite around. Um, but essentially when the crater gets bigger than that, the energy is so much that it just completely destroys whatever hit. It either melts it or it vaporizes it and sends it back off into space. So is there any knowledge about um, what factors affect whether we have those um, pieces of meteorites left or not? It really is to do with the, the energy, you know, so essentially the, you know, as a, uh, I think one of the, up in the classroom you just showed, you were varying the height and with the same ball, you got a bigger crater. So essentially what you're doing there is increasing the energy of the impact, you know, the force. And so the bigger the energy, the bigger the impact crater. And, you know, there's a point where literally, yeah, none of that projectile, the asteroid or comet survives and it just gets, you know, there might be tiny, tiny little dust sized particles left, but we just would never find them or see them. Okay. And a bit of a different question here from, uh, I'm not sure where this question is coming from, but uh, does the size of the meteor affect the speed of the meteor? Um, yes and no. So, um, Essentially, there's kind of two main groups of meteors. Uh, so the asteroids are typically slower, and still slow is 15 to 20 kilometers a second. Um, and uh, the comets tend to be upwards of 70 or 80 kilometers a second. And so, um, yeah, there's kind of two populations. And because of kinetic energy, you know, for those uh, older students, you know, kinetic energy, uh, is a half times mass velocity squared. And so you can form the same size crater from something that's big and slow as something that's small and fast. Um, so that, yeah, that's kind of a, uh, about how it goes. 
Interesting. Now, I want to go back to Ms. Landgraf's class now. I understand we have a question there. Who had a question there? You can either shout it out or come up to the computer. <laughs> this one is actually mine. <laughs> <laughs> Adults are allowed to ask questions too. <laughs> uh, I was so I was curious how you became so interested in uh, impact craters. If this was something you always wanted to do, or if uh, there was like an event that drew you to them, or uh, how you got into it. Yeah, no, it's a great question. It, it, I would say almost by accident. Um, I grew up in the UK, uh, as you may tell from my accent, and I did my first degree in geology in Scotland. And then I was just looking for something different, really. Um, I was interested in coming to Canada for a PhD and for more education, and I just literally um, happened across this project that was in Canada, actually working up in the Arctic and working on meteorite impact craters. And I never really, really knew much about them. I thought it sounded cool. And so, you know, I just took that, took that chance and uh, got on a plane and uh, yeah, and the rest is history. And I'm still studying them today. Wonderful. And we have a question now from Ms. Lily Kropp's class, wondering if asteroids have anything to do with Jupiter's storm eye. Oh, that's a, a great question. And, you know, it's one of those, I would say we honestly have no idea. Um, I don't think people have linked it uh, to the, the, the eye of the storm on Jupiter, um, but I'm not an expert by any means. Um, but, you know, one could imagine, um, and we do have a record of uh, back in 1994, a comet hitting Jupiter, and it did, you know, really um, disrupt uh, the atmosphere of Jupiter. So, yeah. My answer is I don't quite know, and uh, you know it's a great question. Wonderful. And what composition are the meteors mostly made of from space? That that question is coming from Mr. Hughes's class. So, what composition are meteors usually made of? So we had another awesome um, question. Uh, so. Uh, we know we have a pretty good idea of that now because we find not um, bits of the projectile that formed craters, but you know we have lots of meteorites on Earth, thousands of them that were too small to form a crater, and um, most of those are what we call chondrites, so they're very primitive and a, a mix of rock and metal. Um, Actually, about maybe five to ten percent. Um, I think the one that was held up in St. John's there was what we call an iron meteorite. Um, so that is, you know, solid metal, solid iron metal. That's maybe ten percent. And then, you know, ten or twenty percent is really a stone, what we call the stony meteorites, much like any rock that you would pick up on the surface of the Earth. Great. Now I know we are running out of time here, but I did want to ask you today. Why is it important for us to study impact craters on Earth and other planets? We've talked a lot about the research that you do and a lot about how this activity is a model for real impact events. Um, why is any of this important for us to spend time on? Yeah, you know, a, a good question. Um, I think it just because it's, it's super interesting, but of course that's, uh, that's not a good answer. Um, but really what drives my science is you know, there's still lots to learn, so that's one thing. Um, but, you know, there's a, there's a couple of big things. Um, we've mentioned Sudbury quite a bit today. Uh, so Sudbury, if you've ever been there, you know, it's the site of uh, North America's biggest mining camp. And all of those mines are there because a big asteroid, maybe 10 or 15 kilometers in diameter, hit about 2 billion years ago. So meteorite impacts can actually generate economic resources that, you know, help our economy. Um, the other really interesting thing, I think, for, you know, for Earth and for understanding our solar system is that as well as being destructive, and of course that's another reason to study impacts, is we do think they killed off the dinosaurs and lots of other life on Earth 65 million years ago. But I actually look at the beneficial effects of impacts, and we do think that impacts can create habitats like hot, bubbling, warm springs, that may be places where life started on Earth. And so as we're exploring Mars for signs of life, um, these impact craters are there, um, are good targets for where we might send the next rover. And so, you know, there's a few other things, but really, you know, uh, economic resources, understanding, you know, what would happen if a future impact hit, 
and then also you know understanding how life on earth um, originated and whether there's actually life on mars very interesting stuff i love that there's still so much to explore lots that we don't yet know about Absolutely. Uh, and uh, and so maybe if any students are interested there might be a career path here for you but uh, that is all the time we have so thank you dr zinski for joining us today telling us about what it is that you do and, and teaching us a bit about impact craters. You're absolutely welcome. And, you know, if anybody has questions and that later on, you can find me on Twitter at Dr. Crater. And again, hopefully maybe on the uh, Partners in Research website, we can share that uh, URL for this new Impact Earth website that we have where there's lots of information and again, resources for teachers and uh, in a place where you can uh, loan some uh, rockets out to look at the actual products from meteorite impacts. Right. We will certainly be sharing that out so you can have a look on our website as well if you forget what that URL is. But uh, also, once again, thank you to Dr. Parshadi Patel for, uh, for kicking off our activity today and showing our students a model of what that uh, would look like. That was really helpful. Thank you for having me. Hopefully everyone enjoyed making craters and learning a little, little bit about how they're created. Wonderful. And lastly, thank you to the educators and students who joined us today from coast to coast, making craters to celebrate NSERC's Science Literacy Week. Join us again for more PIR live events in the future, including lab tours, demonstrations, and topics anywhere from sustainability to coding to math and magic. And more information on those is posted at pirweb.org. So have a great day, everyone. Thanks so much.